Good morning. Welcome to another Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I'm the curator here at Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate. Glad you're joining us this morning. Please let us know if you're watching and where you're from. And uh, if you have any questions, please remember uh, to post those. My colleagues are watching and they'll help me to note those and I'll answer them uh, as we go along this morning. Uh, it's a uh, a little bit rainy today, but still nice and dry in the house. We hope you're nice and dry at home and safe uh, watching our video at home, and we appreciate you doing so. We want to take the opportunity to thank the pre-mutual funds for their support of this program. Through their efforts, we're able to bring you these programs twice a week, um, and we really appreciate you taking the opportunity to get up with us uh, and watch them. This morning, uh, it's uh, May April 30th which means tomorrow is May 1st, which means Saturday is May 2nd, the first Saturday in May. And we know uh, here in Kentucky what that means. That means that that should be the Derby. Unfortunately, this year, due to the current COVID situation, that's not gonna be happening in, on Saturday. It will hopefully happen later in the year. And uh, hopefully, uh, see, we have uh, one of Henry Clay's descendants joining us. I'm always glad to have the family aboard. Thanks for watching. Sue Andrew, one of our volunteers, is watching. And we got someone from Williamstown, Kentucky. Um, my wife is watching. Thanks, dear. Hope the cat is enjoying it. Apparently, my cat really enjoys these shows. So, anyway, uh, my dogs are not so into it, but you know, they're dogs. They're sleeping this time of day. So, anyway, um, we appreciate you joining us. Um, we're going to try to provide some tonic for your Derby blues. Maybe if you're missing the Derby, um, we're going to provide you with something that'll hopefully help to fill that void and we know it won't completely do so but hopefully provide you with a little something to hold you over and something that you can use when the derby does come along later this year um, today's artifact is a really interesting and important artifact in our collection that is chock full of information so let's take a look at it and get started uh, thinking about our topic for the day so i'm going to turn the camera around here there's our artifact and it doesn't look like much it's a book um, I would guess it's probably, call it, I don't know, eight and a half by 14, something like that, bound in suede leather. Um, if we were to turn it, you notice on the spine that it says day book. These types of books were pretty common in Henry Clay's time and could be used for a variety of purposes. Some people kept a general diary. Henry Clay was not one of those people. I don't think Henry Clay really liked writing. I think he did it because it was necessary. Um, some of his descendants did. Um, some of his descendants were prolific writers. Uh, but oftentimes these were used to keep track of things like family expenses or other activities, business activities, etc. This particular one, Henry Clay used to keep track of his livestock. And he had a wide range of stock. Um, we'll look at some of that in the book. Jacks, jennies, cattle, sheep, pigs, chickens, and of course horses. And we'll talk more about the horses. So I'm going to open the book now. And some of you may be wondering why I'm touching this book without gloves. And the fact of the matter is that often when we handle paper, books and things like that, we don't wear gloves. And the reason for that is that the loss of tactile control is of greater risk to the book than the oils and dirt on my hands. I washed my hands before I did this today uh, so that I wouldn't damage the book. So I'm able to handle it that way. Here's a page labeled Memoranda. Now that's Henry Clay's handwriting. Um, if you read a lot of his letters, you'll recognize it. Uh, I have read a lot of his notes, and so I you know, pretty easily read it. You all may have a little more difficulty. It takes some getting used to, but for example, that is a note about a Holstein heifer um, that he's having, uh, taking to a bull for breeding. Uh, here's one about a Maltese Jeanette. Um, Henry Clay had Jacks and Jennies, not only from the United States, but from Malta and also from France. Um, so that's a note about one of those. Another note about a Jeanette. Here's another mo a bull, Althorpe. Um, and again, he's talking about breeding. So he's keeping track of his transactions uh, with these uh, animals. Here he's receiving an animal called Hector. Let's see, right there. That's, uh, he received Hector. Uh, Hector is, uh, I believe, a cow. Uh, and a Hereford. Hereford. Henry Clay introduced the Hereford to the United States in 1817. Ah, good morning, Bradley Clay. Bradley Clay is a member of the Clay family. He's not a descendant, but he is a relative, um, a great supporter of the estate. The most interesting note on this page is the one at the bottom, um, and it's a, quite a fascinating note to me. Uh, it says, 
Mr. Florio, my new overseer, came and entered into work next morning. And that's dated 9th November, and I believe that was 1837. Albert Florio was overseer here for about five years, from 1837 to 42, and engaged in a number of activities, hemp, livestock, etc. Uh, he's one that we know a fair bit about, at least comparatively speaking. I mean, we know uh, some of his activities and things of that nature. Uh, we also recently, through one of his descendants, learned of his burial place, which is in remote Jessamine County. He left Ashland in 1842, ostensibly to start his own farm, which I think he did, at least briefly. Unfortunately, he died a short time later uh, from an illness and so didn't get to enjoy the farm a great deal. So those are just a variety of memoranda in Henry Clay's hand and the kind of thing that we find in the book. I'm going to flip the book over. And this is interesting. This book is written going uh, both directions. And I don't know quite why, except that it was used by multiple people. You can see here, this says Thomas Clay's Pedigrees of Blooded Cattle, Ashland, May 7th, 1838. It's almost exactly on that date, actually. Thomas H. Clay is Henry Clay's son. He had a great many cattle. Henry Clay had cattle. Uh, one of the things Henry Clay did with his sons was set them up in business and in farming. Um, he had what was sort of a family corporation, and cattle was something that he did with Thomas. And you can see here uh, notes. These are actually in Henry Clay's hand, more notes about uh, various stock. But if we turn on in here, um, there are uh, pedigrees of some of Henry Clay's uh, cattle, and Tom's, Thomas's cattle as well. So this was used by multiple generations and by multiple people. Today I want to focus on horses. Uh, I want to talk about some of Henry Clay's horses, three in particular that are extremely important, um, that are important uh, to Henry Clay and to the Derby. And we're going to start with this horse, Yorkshire. Yorkshire was Henry Clay's prize stallion, bred in 1834 in England, imported to the United States. Um, it was given to Henry Clay in 1846 by a man named Commodore Charles Morgan, a family friend. Uh, Morgan was a United States Navy officer. Uh, he captained the ship and would later bring Henry Clay's son home from Portugal. Uh, so someone Henry Clay knew well. This broadside was actually written by Henry Clay's son, John. John took over the family thoroughbred business about 1842 and ran it until his death in 1887. Uh, this was in Henry Clay's time. This was 1851. So Clay would have known of this and perhaps had some input in the broadside. And it's a broadside advertising him standing at stud. Um, and you can see here, uh, this talks about his pedigree. And this traces his, his uh, sire back a whole bunch of generations and his dam even more. Uh, one of the things that thoroughbred owners and breeders have done for Oh, well over 200 years, maybe 300 years, is track these bloodlines very carefully. And you can track horses today all the way back, often to the original three thoroughbreds. So uh, that's something that was really important. When you bred these horses, you wanted to create or have the best chance of creating a horse that was a great racer or whatever. So you looked at the bloodlines to see what they had done and how important those lines were in order uh, to breed the best to the best. And that was something Henry Clay did very, very well. Yorkshire was not a great racer, did have a racing career, not very long. Um, it, was, it was not a greatly successful career. That said, he was extremely successful in the stud barn, uh, one of the great sires in thoroughbred history. Uh, you can find his name in the pedigrees of a great many horses, including many winners and participants in the Kentucky Derby. As important as that is, that's not actually how horse lineages typically trace. And that brings us to... Henry Clay's prize mares. So I'm going to come down here. You can see on this page, Margaret Wood. Margaret Wood uh, was bred in 1840, fold in 1840, uh, and given to Henry Clay in 1845. Margaret Wood was a gift from a friend by the name of Wade Hampton. Some of you may be familiar with Wade Hampton. Wade Hampton was an important politician from South Carolina. His son was a Civil War general. Uh, my family has a legend that we are descended from Wade Hampton. I don't know if that's true. Um, anyway, uh, Margaret Wood became one of Henry Clay's two great uh, mares in his barn um, and has many Kentucky Derby winners descended from her. Uh, she didn't race much. Mares didn't typically race. 
um, but was very, very successful in the breeding barn. And this is some of her pedigree. Uh, we're talking about her dam, Maria West, and then an imported horse, Priam. That's her sire. Um, and goes on to talk about uh, that. It talks about her produce being listed on page 35. So more information is found on other pages. Another horse that's very important is Magnolia. Here's Magnolia. And this is not Henry Clay's handwriting. I'm not sure. This may be John's. Um, but this is not his. But again, it's got uh, her information. Uh, she was uh, foaled 1841 and given to Henry Clay by a good friend named Dr. William Mercer. William Mercer ran a hospital in New Orleans. And when Henry Clay visited New Orleans, which he did almost every winter later in his life, he would stay with Dr. Mercer. Dr. Mercer visited Ashland sometimes. Um, they were very, very close. And he gave this horse to Henry Clay. Um, and he gives her pedigree here again. Uh, which is just like a person's genealogy. If you go on Ancestry, it's the same thing. Father, mother, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on. And that's traced very far back. So again, it talks about her produce on page 35. So if we flip the book back over to where we started, we can go here. This is Magnolia. And you can see here a list of the animals, the horses that she birthed. Uh, and there are some important ones. Kentucky. This is Kentucky, right here. This is actually a statue uh, by the same woman that did the statues in Thoroughbred Park downtown. That's, uh, Kentucky uh, was one of the great racehorses of all time. Uh, I think he had one loss against 20 or 30 victories. Uh, became a great sire as well. Um, and there are a number of others that are listed here uh, to her that are of great importance. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, as we go forward, uh, skedaddle is one that we'll talk a little bit about. And this is Squeezum. This is a, a, an offspring of uh, skedaddle. And we'll talk about Squeezum. So again, you can see the horses. The, uh, Daystar is a Kentucky Derby winner. So we'll talk about that here presently. But those are all offspring of Magnolia and Margaret Wood. Now, I'm going to come over here. I have this board. We did an exhibit out at the Kentucky Horse Park, and they made these for the exhibit. This was in 2005. These are the offspring, of, are the descendants of Margaret Wood and Magnolia that have won the Derby. And the way this works, it, we trace this in what is called the female tail line, which means descendants descended by mare. So each of these horses, their mare was descended from Magnolia or Margaret Wood. So... If you go back, and you know, when you get down to like 1983, you're going back five, six, seven generations on that one line, that female tail line, that mare line. Mare, grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and so on. Uh, this is how pedigrees are traced in the horse business. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that mares typically are relatively stationary. Uh, sires are brought to them, so it's easier to trace that way. It's, it is just how it's done. We learned that from... Uh, one of the uh, prominent uh, breeding people at one of the prominent horse farms here in Kentucky. So uh, that's an important thing to know. And if you want to do this, there is a website called pedigreequery.com. It's what I use. And if you go to that website, you can put a horse's name in the search blank at the top, and it will give you the complete pedigree of that horse. And if you keep clicking the female tail line and you eventually see Magnolia or Margaret Wood, you know that horse is descended from Henry Clay's. So you can do that You're on your own. It's very easy to do. So we have a total of 11 Kentucky Derby winners tracing to Magnolia and Margaret Wood. We'll start with, Margaret, well, with Magnolia. And I want to start with Daystar. Daystar is a pretty important animal in our story. That's Daystar. Not a great picture. Doesn't tell you a lot about the horse, frankly. Uh, Daystar, Daystar was born in 1875. That's actually a typo. Uh, and won the Derby in 1878. Notice, Daystar was bred by John M. Clay. So Daystar was bred right here out of Ash at Ashland. And Daystar was sired by that horse. That's Star Davis. And that is Star Davis standing here at Ashland. Um, I'm going to come in here a little bit because behind you. But those are some of the buildings that John had. This tower, if you can see that tower, was actually in the middle of his track. And he used it to observe his horses in training. Uh, these paintings, this painting is by an artist named Thomas Scott. Uh, that's Star Davis. This is Star Davis's pedigree. If you want to know what a pedigree is like, this is called a pedigree wheel. And it basically presents its genealogy in circular form. So on one side you have the sire, on the other you have the dam, and it traces them back through many generations. 
Um, so that is Star Davis's pedigree. Um, so if you wanted to know Daystar's pedigree, it's basically this pedigree plus the pedigree of Squeezum, his uh, uh, dam. Now, that is uh, Skedaddle. And that is the Slashes. This is another Thomas Scott painting of those horses at Ashland. Uh, uh, Skedaddle is the mother of Squeezum. And at one time we thought that was Squeezum, but it's not. That's, the, uh, that's her last foal, not her first. So anyway, uh, Daystar was bred here at Ashland. One of several bred here at Ashland uh, that won the Derby. Uh, Lauren, 1938. Derby, Middle Ground. Get down here on my knee, you can see better. Middle ground won the Derby in 1950, 1960. Venetian Way, 1983. Sunny's Halo. This is the last Kentucky Derby winner we've had, uh, descended from one of the female tail lines. I'll come up here to Margaret Wood. Margaret Wood. Uh, Riley won the 1890. That is also bred here at Ashland. This says bred by Mrs. John N. Clay. The fact of the matter is, we thought Henry Clay's wife, Josephine, did in fact breed Riley. Reality is, Riley was born in 1887, which is the year John died. So, she would have been bred, uh, her, or he would have been bred, the horse would have been conceived, probably in 1886. So I think John and Josephine worked together on that. John would have still been alive. He still would have been managing the operation. But she probably participated. And when he died, she took over and managed it in her own right. And I'll show you a catalog of hers here in just a second. Uh, 1892, Azra. I want to talk about 1896, Ben Brush. Uh, this is a very important horse. There are a lot of, he appears in a lot of uh, sire lines. Regret, 1915, Philly. Now that's really important. Regret was the first Philly to win the Kentucky Derby, and there have only been three. That Derby changed the Kentucky Derby. That Derby made the race, the famous and important race that it is today. Uh, see, we have a watcher from Greenville, and Eric Westman is watching. Thank you both. Uh, so Regret's a very, very, very important horse. The modern derby is, is a popular and famous race in large part because of this race. There was so much attention paid to the fact that a filly was running and nobody thought a filly could win that it made the race much bigger than it was previously. And it's credited as being the race that made it an important race as it is today. Now I'm going to come down here. Uh, uh, Exterminator in 1918. Magnol uh, Margaret Wood went on a big dry spell until 1982. We've got Gato del Sol. So those are the Kentucky Derby winners. Sue points out, and rightly so, that Magnolia and Margaret Wood and all thoroughbreds are part of families. These are known by alphanumeric designations. So Magnolia is 4M. Mag uh, Margaret Wood is A1. So if you were to look up a pedigree and it said this horse is in one of those families, they are descended in the female tail line from these two. Now, these are not the origin horses of either family. There are horses earlier than that, but they are pretty early in those families, and the horses that we talk about as winning the Derby are descended from them. So these are very, very important horses, very, very important part of thoroughbred racing today. So I mentioned Josephine. I'm going to come over here. This is Josephine's racing catalog, or uh, stock catalog from her brood mares for 1906. And if you look carefully at the bottom, she lists some of the horses we talked about. Daystar is listed there. Riley, those are their derby winners. Maggie Beebe was called the Empress of the Stud Book. Maggie Beebe uh, is found in many of the uh, female tail lines uh, of Magnolia. Uh, she's a descendant of Magnolia, and most of the horses that have been in the derby from Magnolia uh, trace through Maggie Beebe. Um, that's Josephine with one of her horses. Uh, she would often walk on, on the farm. She was known to wear a straw hat, and she would allow the horses to nibble on her hat. And she had names. She knew all their names and would call them by name. And she kind of felt like she had a personal relationship with her horses. Uh, if you're interested in this, every year, 
when the derby comes, I go on pedigree query and I trace all of the entrants in the derby and the oaks. And I will post on our social media and on our website the horses that are running that are descended from Henry Clay's two mares. And almost every year we have an entrant. It's very rare to have a year that we don't. In the 18 and a half years I've been here, I've had maybe two or three years tops that we haven't had an entrant. Now, I will note, we've not had a winner since 1983. I keep saying every year, maybe this will be the year, and hopefully before I finish my tenure at Ashland, we'll have a winner, and that hasn't happened yet. So, you're welcome to use the information however you like. If you choose to bet, that's up to you, but you're on your own. I make no guarantees. <laughs> be forewarned. Now I want to tell you a story about another horse that is very important in Ashland's story. And this horse is not in any of the female tail lines. In fact, I don't think it's even descended from Yorkshire. I don't think it's descended at all. But it was bred here at Ashland, owned by the Clay family, and it won the Derby. And that horse is Allen Adale, 1902. So this horse was owned by Thomas Clay McDowell. Thomas Clay McDowell was a great-grandson of Henry Clay, uh, son of Henry Clay and Anne Clay McDowell who owned Ashland. Uh, Thomas Clay McDowell uh, lived here at the estate and had a great breeding operation, was a very successful thoroughbred breeder. He is credited with breeding, training, and owning this horse, which is very rare. Most uh, have not done that. Most people uh, do one or two of the three, but not all. In point of fact, this man actually did the training. This man is Courtney Matthews. Courtney Matthews uh, was not credited because he's African-American. And at this time, African-Americans had grown great fame and wealth through horse racing, and that didn't sit well with white owners. So they were pushing them out of the business. And so he was not given the credit he probably should be given as trainer. The jockey for Allen Adele was Jimmy Winkfield. Jimmy Winkfield was also African-American. He is the last African-American to win the Derby. The last time that happened, 1902, Allen Adele. This race was a very interesting race. Uh, there were four entrants, which is the smallest derby on record. Two of them were owned by Thomas. The other one was a horse called The Rival, ridden by a white jockey, his primary jockey. Jimmy found out that, you know, he was going to ride and knew that he was not going to be given the best horse. So he did all the training. So he intentionally figured out that Allen Adele was the best horse and rode it slightly slower so that he would get that horse for the derby, which he did. Because there were only four entrants, it took a lot of work for him to manipulate those entrants so that he could win the race. And what he did was slowly but surely push each horse further and further out on the track. At that time, in the winter, they would cover the track with sand and they'd push it off to the edge when it came time to race. Well, he pushed them out into that sand and they bogged down and he ended up winning the race. He was asked at the end of the race uh, why he looked so tired. And he said, well, I've been riding four horses. And that's what he meant. He'd been managing all four horses. So uh, he was really an incredible athlete. It's very unfortunate that due to uh, the Jim Crow era and the racism of the time that he was forced out in the United States, but he was very successful in Europe for many, many years. Uh, so he's a great part of our story. Uh, this is a great part of our story. Uh, the only horse the family ever owned to win the Derby, um, Allen Adele in 1902. If there are any questions, I'll take them. I'm going to have to go kind of quick. It looks like my phone battery may be running out. So... Uh, anyway, I guess I've spoken so much that my words have used up the battery. I'll come back over here and look at the stock book a little more. But thank you again for tuning in. Next Tuesday, we'll have a very exciting program. We're going to be having uh, some old friends, uh, David and Jeannie Heidler, authors of uh, Henry Clay, The Essential American. We will be talking to them about compromise, among other things. Uh, so please tune in to that, 9 a.m. next Tuesday. Um, I'll be interviewing them with assistance from Cameron. And next Thursday, we'll probably be talking about mothers because it will be approaching Mother's Day. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good weekend, and thank you very much.